Okay, let's start. Okay, so um, today we have the pleasure of uh, greeting uh, Thorsten Inslin, who uh, is going to give us uh, his presentation on information field theory. Uh, I would like to give like a, just a very quick summary of uh, his, uh, his past, basically, uh, and uh, that he did his PhD uh, from 96 to 99 uh, at uh, Bonn University and Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. Uh, and on relativistic particles, magnetic fields, and uh, so things that uh, actually will also uh, be uh, interested in presenting, I guess, uh, today um, uh, as part of the information field theory. Then he, did a, he had a, a postdoc in Toronto and Max Planck um, uh, Institute for Astrophysics, where he got upgraded to tenure track and finally got tenured in 2006. Uh, he was part of the Planck Analysis Group uh, and as such got the um, uh, the group award from the Gruber Foundation to the Planck Collaboration, and the Coconi Prize. Uh, and since 2014, he's uh, he head, um, heading this uh, information field theory group at MPA. Uh, and uh, he's using this tool for continuing the hand for radio astronomical imaging. Uh, as a side note, so this uh, IFT uh, uh, work has also led to a North Sprung Award in 2018 for some of the students that started, has made a startup basically based on this work. So, uh, Thorsten, you have the floor and uh, we're ready to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind of invitation and the opportunity to present you what I and my group is working on information field theory. Um, how to start? Well, maybe I should start was um, one of my hobbies. One of my hobbies is uh, galactic tomography. So to reconstruct the 3D structure of the Milky Way in its different constituents. Is this possible? Let's look at this problem for a minute in order to get a feeling for um, why we might need something like information field theory. Okay, so we know, the, we know where we are. We are roughly here. And we might want to learn about the magnetic structure somewhere in the Milky Way. One way to learn about this is to probe it. And things that probe the Milky Way with regard to magnetic structures are pulsars. So if you have a pulsar behind a magnetic structure, it sends pulses, they get finely rotated and dispersed. So they probe the magneto-ionic medium between us and the pulsar and give us information about its average composition. If we have a second pulsar in front of this magnetic structure, we might be able to identify its presence uh, via taking the differences of the properties uh, extracted from the data. So pulsars give us a number of ways to probe um, electron densities, magnetic fields, maybe also turbulence. There are other probes. Um, there are extragalactic sources which uh, emit um, polarized light, which also allow us today to uh, find rotation measurements, which give us line of sight information about the magnetic field times the electron density. There might be ultra energy cosmic rays. If we would know where they come from, we could learn something from the magnetic deflection. Then we have stars and the starlight gets processed by the interstellar medium. For example, dust absorbs starlight and um, that leaves characteristic signatures in the starlight. So we can learn something about dust between us and the stars. The positions and the kinematics of stars tell us something about densities, about the gravitational potential. Um, the interstellar medium itself is emitting in various wave bands uh, due to a number of processes, which all give us information. So can we put all this information together in order to get a 3D picture of the Milky Way in all its constituent? The answer is no. There, is, there are too many unknowns and many of these processes tell us about combination of, um, combination of, of uh, uh, quantities uh, and, 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 and not direct quantity alone. That means um, we, have to do all these things also together. We can't do this in isolation. So we have to fuse the data together, but even that is not enough in information in order to do, determine all degrees of freedom a galaxy like the Milky Way could have. 
So we need additional information, which we have to fuse in, in into our reasoning. And what could that be? Well, we know that many physical quantities are correlated. If I know the value of a field, like the density field at one location, I have often a good idea that at nearby location, it has a similar value because strong gradients are usually eroded by transport processes or not so easily produced. So many of the quantities we look at in physics and astrophysics exhibit correlations and we can use these correlations in order to constrain um, the possible configurations of our fields, which then make up the Milky Way. Then there might be approximate symmetries, physical laws, empirical laws, which we might and actually need to fold it into our reasoning. Uh, okay, how to do that? That's what my talk is about. Um, first, in, in, if one looks at this list of possible probes of the Milky Way, um, a good number of these yellow lists will appear in my talk. Good. We want to do data fusion. So let's assume we look at the Milky Way with a number of telescopes like radio, uh, microwave, gamma ray telescopes, and each of them receives signals uh, from the Milky Way. So it probes the Milky Way in a certain way. And in order to go back from the data of these telescopes to the Milky Way, we have to understand um, the relation between the data and the things it looks at. So we have to understand how the instrument responds to say emissivities epsilon. And if we are interested in physical quantities, we have to understand how the emissivities depend on physical parameters like density, temperature, magnetic field strength, and so on. How to do this? Okay, we need a data model. And let's assume we are in the situation that our, our data DI, so the ice number we have measured with a certain telescope, is some response to emission field plus noise. And if you have a linear uh, response, like given as a second line here, maybe I should point it. Do you see this pointer? I think yes. So if the response is linear, then the emissivity, which is a field, a function over space and frequency, and maybe also time, gets probed linearly by a response function. And the response tells us how the different locations and uh, frequencies, and maybe also times, talk into the individual data bin I. This makes clear that we have a problem if you want to go from the data to the emissivities, because the emissivities are fields, quantities that depend on a continuous quant uh, coordinate where the data is discrete. Uh, we have a finite set of numbers measured. So the problem is to infer an infinite number of numbers from a finite one. And that is ill-posed, so we have to fold in other information. And I would argue the ideal way to do that is via information field theory. So what is that? Information field theory is simply information theory for fields. So I have to explain you two things, what are fields and what is information theory, and then I'm basically done. What is a field I already said? A field is a continuous function of space and time or more or less continuous, um, which follows some physical or other laws, which uh, make sure that this is not too wild. Knowing a field means to know this function at each location. And since they are too large, there are a large number of locations. The configuration space of possible field configurations is huge. It's actually in Hilbert space. So over this space of possible field configuration, we want to do, uh, we have to do probability theory because our data will never tell us exactly what the field is. Right? We will always have uncertainties and these uncertainties are best dealt with probability theory. So we have to do probabilities over spaces of functions. And um, physicists have developed uh, methods for that. Um, they are called uh, statistical field theories. And for these methods, uh, a number of um, algorithms or techniques have been developed, like for example, um, Feynman diagrams. So what you see here on the top left in Feynman diagrams is um, 
if you would see it completely, is actually an algorithm in order to calculate the non-Gaussianity of the cosmic microwave background, for example. So such methods like Feynman diagrams can be used in order to derive algorithms which extract certain uh, quantities from the data. In this case, um, the non-Gaussianity uh, that is most probable given a certain CMB field. Information field theory is not only a theory, it can also be applied to data. And in my talk, you will see a number of applications. Um, one is um, the Faraday sky. So taking extragalactic Faraday rotation sources and um, turning this point measurement of the Faraday effect, which probes the galactic magnetic field into a map of this projected galactic magnetic field. Another one is CSS reconstruction of the gravitational potential at the last scattering surface of the cosmic microwave background. So the when the universe was only 380,000 years old, um, calculated from the uh, CMB fluctuations you see on the left. And the right thing, and this will be discussed in this talk, is a gamma ray sky as measured and reconstructed from data from the Fermi satellite. Okay, let's look at um, the problem in more detail. So we have these fantastic instruments which tell us about the sky. Um, so they record the sky signal somehow and give us data. From that data, we want to go back to the sky signal. However, as we discussed, this is not uniquely possible. There are an infinite number of solutions to this problem, which are potential skies, which would have produced more or less the same data. How to pick between them? The answer is we have to put constraints on what the sky could do. And these constraints should encode our no knowledge about the sky. So we have to basically to put in models. And let's start very simple. Let's make a very simplistic model of the sky. Um, for example, oops, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. For example, that we say the sky is composed out of diffuse emission and point sources. That should be our model. In reality, the sky is more complex, but let's, let's see how far this takes us. Now we have an even larger problem. Now we have to dis, uh, reconstruct two skies, one of the diffuse emission, one of the point sources. So we have to say what, they, what we mean with diffuse emission and point sources in order to take these uh, two components apart. Um, for point sources, we could say they can be everywhere, they are uncorrelated mostly, and they are drawn from some luminosity function, which we might know or might not, but which might be the same everywhere on the sky, more or less. For diffuse emission, we would say it's correlated. If you know diffuse emission at one location, you have a good idea what is a neighboring location. Um, and this correlation structure might be similar at different locations. You do not need necessarily to know this correlation structure a priori um, because your data gives you clues about that. And by being correlated, this defines what we mean with diffuse emission. Okay, so now we have this hierarchical model and we want to infer all the things above the data. What is the sky? What is the diffuse emission? Maybe what is the correlation structure? Um, that's complicated, so let's simplify things a little bit by calling everything which we do not know but would like to know, let's call all these things together the signal. So we want to infer the signal from the data. The signal might have an internal structure as I shown before, but for the next slide, let's keep it that simple. So signal determines data to some degree, but we want to go back from the data to the signal. How to do this? Okay, let's first look at all possible things that could happen. Now we have data coordinates, we have signal coordinates and a big space in it. And then someday we get some data. So we know we are in the data plane here. And that means in signal space, we are anywhere in the subspace, which is here marked with one red line, but actually it's higher dimensional. Where is not clear from the data alone. What we need is a structure in the space, which tells us where to look, where to what is plausible and what is not plausible along this line. And this structure is given by the joint probability distribution of data and signal, which is some probability cloud in this high dimensional space. 
Once we have the data, we cut this cloud along this line and renormalize. And this gives us the so-called conditional probability of what the signal could be given that we now know what the data is. Okay, looks simple, straightforward, but there are a few technical problems. One is we need to get this uh, probability distribution, this uh, PDS. If we have it, we can just normalize, we set, fix the data to what is observed and normalize it, but we need it in the first place. How to get it? In machine learning, most machine learning techniques can be understood as, uh, as taking samples, where, uh, index samples where you know what the signal is, so you know their location and signal and data space, and somehow construct explicitly or implicitly a probability distribution around those. But in astrophysics, this is dangerous. We don't know what the ground truth is. And we don't want to put our prejudices in, at, at least in a, we want to put them in a, in a controlled way, I would argue. And so we have to do something different. What we can do is we can translate our knowledge into a prior probability distribution over the signal. And then given a certain signal, we describe how likely it is to have the certain data, the likelihood, PDS, um, and multiplying these together gives us this joint probability distribution from which uh, we can construct this posterior of what is S given D. And this is not new, probably you all have seen it, that's Bayes' theorem, which we all love or hate. Um, the reason why I'm using Bayes' theorem for my work is not only that there is this construction, but, so, but also of the so-called Cox theorem. So Cox showed in 1946 that if you take binary logic with true and false and you want to extend it to uncertainty, that you basically end up with base. So with using probabilities for reasoning as an extension of logic. And using logic for scientific uh, uh, conclusion is something which I find appealing. Okay, let's accept we use base theorem. Let's rewrite base theorem a little bit, namely this way, where I write the num a numerator as e to minus an energy and the denominator I just given your name. This way, it looks much more like statistical mechanics where I've put the temperature to one. Um, and can I do this? Yes, I can always do this by just defining this energy as the negative or potential as a negative logarithm of my probability dis distribution of the numerator. Then it is just an identity. And for reasons which might become clearer later, let's call this thing information. This has two advantages. One is now I can talk about information theory. And, um, um, and, and I've, as I've promised you, I will tell you what it is. It is basically working with this quantity. Second is, it is a handy quantity, as you will see in a second. So first look at the normalization, this partition function, or also called evidence, P of D. That is the probability for the data, irrespective of what the signal is. So I have to integrate over all signal configuration of this joint probability. And then we have this product rule that the joint probability of data and signal is that of the data given the signal times the probability of the signal, so the product rule. If we translate this product rule into this information coordinate by just taking the negative logarithm, we find that the information of data and signal is that of the data given the signal plus the information of the signal. So information is additive and that's fantastic. Remember, you know, all good things in life are additive, mass, momentum, money, love, all additive. Um, and what is the advantage of this? Well, you can look at it as you add information if you put certain things together this way. So for example, the, the likelihood information function defines you a metric in your signal space. And this often does not determine everything. So you have also what people would call a regularization. 
if you want to ask what is the most likely, what, what most probable um, single configuration, you could, instead of maximizing the joint probability, you can minimize this metric and regularization. Or if you have two instruments, data one and data two, and the instruments are independent, but measure the same ground reality, then the information is additive. So this allows us to answer the question, how to do data fusion. You just add the information potentials of the different instruments. In order to get used to this information perspective, um, let's translate some very simple case um, from probability space into information space. So imagine there's a one-dimensional quantity S and we know it is Gaussian distributed a priori. In information, we have to take the negative logarithm and we find that well, a Gaussian, a Gaussian is um, e to minus a quadratic form. And so the information is this quadratic form plus some constant. So in this case, a parabola. You can ask questions to um, our probability, what is the most likely case? That is the minimum of this information function. What is your width? All these things can be asked equivalent on the left and the right hand side. The essential thing is that this uh, probability is proportional to e to minus a quadratic term, and this um, information is this quadratic term. Now we get some data, and this comes with a Gaussian likelihood, as indicated with the green curve. We translate this into the information language, get a parabola. We know information is additive, so we add these two parabolas, get a third one, a more narrow one, and translates this back into probabilities. And then we have our posterior probability. Now shifted in between what the prior and the likelihood preferred, say compromising between these two uh, statements and being more narrow than both of them. So you probably have seen this. It works very nice in one dimension. The important point is that it also works in an infinite number of dimensions. So imagine we want to um, reconstruct here this radiation field from um, the water surface next to Corsica. Um, this has many, many degrees of freedom, but we still can do probability theory over that, or we want to do probability theory over that. How to do this? Well, let's first simplify the situation a little bit. Instead of working with an infinite number of degrees of freedom, Let's work with a finite number of degrees of freedom and just pixelize the space um, and say um, at each pixel we have only one field value. Then we can do probabilities over finite dimensional spaces and that is well founded. But of course the resolution might not suffice for the situation, so we should in addition require that the resolution can be increased and further increased and further increased. Um, and from a certain point on, hopefully we have resolved all relevant details. And from that point on, we can claim that we have reached the continuous limit. Um, and this, this conceptual procedure to saying, okay, I have a problem defined in continuous space. And then I make discretization of that. And I request that the discretization can be refined, but always with respect to the continuous case, which I specified in the beginning, that ensures that whatever you do does not depend uh, on your pixelization so much. So it becomes pixel independence. Of course, you end up, even if you work with a, with a, with a pixelization, because you do it on a computer, um, a finer pixelization, um, you end up with many degrees of freedom, maybe more degrees of freedoms and you have data that constrain it. So you have to regularize. And in, in information field theory, to a large degree, we exploit correlations. If you know the correlation structure of a field, so what is, if I know it at, at one location, how similar is it as at other locations? And how is this correlation the case if I go further away? If I have a rough idea of what this is between all pairs of points, I have an infinite number of statements. And this is sufficient in order to regularize the problem. So let me show you how this works in practice. Here are 42 data points. 
and reconstruction of an underlying field with various uh, resolutions and increasing the resolution uh, lets the uh, solution converge to one number, uh, to one, one configuration. What we had to put in here was knowledge about the field correlation structure. So it, there's a price with doing that. But if you do that, then um, you can reconstruct more degrees of freedom than you had data. If you want to do this by yourself, I recommend you to use the package numerical information field theory, which my group maintains. And with that, you can, well, this is a probabilistic programming language with auto differentiation. So it has some similarity like TensorFlow. Um, with that, you can um, reconstruct signals. So on the left is a, say, a synthetic signal, right a reconstruction from noisy data. It was a few lines of code. And the code which does this contains, um, well, it gets a library and then it, it contains a line which says, do this in a so-called regular grid space with n pixels, so a one-dimensional coordinate. If in this code you change just this line to being two-dimensional, the very same code does this. It produces synthetic 2D signals, synthetic 2D data, and from this data, it reconstructs in 2D the field. So we have abstracted away the dimensionality of the underlying manifolds over which the field lives. Yeah? You can also go to this sphere by uh, replacing um, the space with a heel pix pixelization of the sphere. And internally, all the correlation structures are interpreted for the specific space you're working in. So that allows you to prototype an inference code for a signal in one dimension. And then once you have debugged it, to uh, use it in two, three, or, or spherical dimensions. Essentially, for doing that are the correlations. So let's look how to describe correlations. Let's imagine we want to do a pixelized image and let's do the smallest pixelized image where correlations play a role, one with two pixels. Let's call the values S1 and S2 of these two pixels and put them into a vector. So over this two dimensional vector space, we might have some prior knowledge of what is possible. So like here, we assume that S1 is correlated with S2. Uh, we have about so you have about 20 minutes left. Uh, so. Yeah, thank you, perfect. So let's, let's assume we get some data and this data measures only one of the degrees of freedom as one plus some noise. So the likelihood is uh, depicted here and it constrains the S1 coordinate, but not the S2 coordinate. Combining likelihood and prior, but constrains both coordinates because um, S1 is constrained by the likelihood and S2 is then um, constrained by the prior, which said that S1 and S2 are correlated. Okay, how to describe this mathematically? Let's assume that this is a Gaussian, that we have Gaussian statistics. Uh, so that um, the probability of S1 and S2 is given as a quadratic form as, as, as depicted here between uh, S with some inverse covariance matrix. The covariance matrix just says how the different pixels are correlated. And this describes, for example, this uh, Gaussian correlated probability distribution if we have here this off diagonal terms. It works in 2D. It actually works in n dimensions by just making the matrix larger. And it works in an infinite number of dimensions by turning um, the vectors into functions and this into an operator or a yeah, two-point correlation function. Um, now we have to specify uh, this two-point correlation function. And let's assume we are in the situation where this is translationally invariant. So the correlation at one location are not so different from that at another location. So it's only a function of the distance between uh, the two points. Then one can show that this operator becomes diagonal if you go to Fourier coordinates. So now, and only depends on one dimensional function down here, the so-called power spectrum. And the different Fourier modes now are uncorrelated. So this gives us a language, language in which to express naturally correlation structures, which we will use in order, for example, to uh, describe diffuse emission. Okay, 
So now we know how to describe correlation structures. We have to specify the power spectrum, which, are, which is often a power law like depicted here. There might be deviation from this, so we might put a Gaussian process on top of that in order to allow for deviation. Then our diffuse emission of the sky could be could look like this, which uh, 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 which is a realization drawn from Gaussian of this uh, power law, uh, power spectrum. Sorry. We have also diffused uh, various other point sources on the sky, so we set up a process for this. They add up as a sky signal. So this is a model, a statistical model for the sky. And since it's a statistical model, we can draw different realizations of it in order to see whether our prior assumptions are reasonable or not. So here's a different realization of the power spectrum, the uh, corresponding sky, a different power spectrum on sky, more extreme one, a very extreme one, and maybe a more reasonable one. So you got the picture. So we can look into the possible configuration of the sky given the simple model. Now we can say we have observed the sky with the telescope and um, got data and can ask the question, can we go back to the data to all the degrees of freedom above? And let's do this for a telescope like Fermi, which recorded photons from the sky. So if you write down all the probabilities involved here, take the negative logarithms in order to get this information function, we add up with a function like this. Don't look at the details, I just want to give you an impression that this, how, how these uh, information field theoretical information functions look like. Basically, they are Poisson likelihood for uh, log normal processes, diffuse priors, which are um, Gaussian fields, terms to describe the correlation structure, hyper priors for the point sources and uh, for the diffuse emission. Now, what to do with this? We could minimize it with respect to the unknowns which gives us a maximum posteriori solution. But since we have a sort of degeneracy in the description, actually this does not work so well in high dimensional settings. We should do something uh, more advanced. And here we use techniques from artificial intelligence, which are used in order to train neural networks. So basically we reformulate our problem as a neural network. You might ask, how does this network look like? Ah, I'd already shown it to you. That should appear, here it is. It is, that is the basic architecture of our networks, where all these things are layers of the networks. The arrows in between are operations um, which determine how the network processes things from top to down. The difference to new usual neural network is that for us, all these layers and connections have meanings. So we do not need to guess what is the best architecture the problem tells us. Here is a, on a more technical level how we could uh, picture this, but uh, since I should go faster, let me talk for a second how we do it technically. So we formulate our problem as these hierarchical models. Um, and if we put it in the data, then um, the unknowns might have a posterior which looks like that. And that's a very high dimensional function. Um, and which we have to explore and just going to the uh, maximum of this function um, is not sufficient because we have to take to an account that there are huge volume factors involved. What my group is currently doing is solving this approximately via variational inference method. So with a method called metric Gaussian variation inference with which we fit a Gaussian, a high dimensional Gaussian into this uh, probability distribution. Um, and this method allows us also to draw from this approximate um, posterior samples, which we can then analyze. We can calculate the mean or the variance of only any quantity. Um, so each of these samples corresponds to a potential reality of the world to which we then can ask questions. And the ensemble of these samples encodes the uncertainty we have about this potential realization of the world. Here's the algorithms. I skip details in order to show you results. So let's apply this to a one dimensional problem. Here we have photon counts as a function of time 
measured from a magnetar flare. So you see there are zero counts down here, one counts, two counts, and they scatter because there's Poisson noise. The black line is a reconstruction using basically the model I've shown you before from that data. And you see it reconstructs um, some wiggling curve as a function of time. It has some uncertainty. And after second 88, this detector was dead, but our method thinks there must be a structure like this. It's not very certain about it. It says, I'll oh, be careful. I haven't, don't have data, but it believes that there should be a bump here. I give you a second to think about why our method could have come to the idea to predict a bump at this location. The answer is in the picture. Okay, usually I ask the audience, but in this case, I give you the answer directly. The algorithm spotted that this seems to be a periodic signal. Look, this, this, this structure over here, oh, sorry, this structure over here is also here. This P corresponds to that. So this structure should, might also be over here. What was the mental representation um, of this potential periodicity? Well, the method, um, he, he, here's a light curve which shows that indeed there was a periodicity, but the method um, has in fields the power spectrum. And there are these resonance lines you see here, which corresponds um, to the uh, uh, orbital period, uh, the rotational period of, the, of this magnetar. So here you see basically the neurons of the neural network, which we use in order to infer that signal. And um, the representation of periodicity are these, the presence of these lines. Good, two dimensions. Um, here in two dimensions on the sphere, you have photon cones from the Fermi satellites. Color encodes the photon energy with red being a giga electron volt and blue nearly um, half a tera electron volt and brightness indi indicates the log brightness of the sky. Using basically the same algorithm, we denoise the sky, we decompose it into, uh, we, we deconvolve it. You see the red points get small, so the point spread function is taken out. We decompose it into diffuse emission and point sources because we are inferring two skies. So diffuse emission, you can do spectroscopy by eye, while these orange areas over here are molecular cloud complexes, mostly hadronic interaction of cosmic rays. And the green stuff with the Fermi bubbles shows you inverse Compton scattering. Our method also gives uncertainty information. So here is how certain the method is about um, certain features in the diffuse sky. It is most certain in the galactic plane where it has many photons, at least certain at the location of point sources. Uh, sorry, Thorsten, you have about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Fine, fine, thanks. Um, here we have, um, again, this gamma ray sky, and I'm showing this in order to show you the similarity to the dust emission from Iris and Planck. So these are gamma rays, mostly hadronic interaction of cosmic ray protons with gas. Here you see where dust is, also a trace of dense locations, and they look morphologically similar, which makes physically sense. Dust is fantastic because we not only see it in emission, we also see it in absorption with Gaia. And for the absorption of starlight, we know from where it is roughly because we have the position of the stars and can select nearby stars. Like here, stars within 400 parsec. We can model, therefore, then uh, this dust absorption um, and since we have 3D information, this is actually a three-dimensional model of the dust around the local superbubble. So this is, uh, shows the walls around the superbubble, which is the center, um, and the dust clouds around it. And um, basically, with similar techniques as I've just shown you, the sun is in the center of this cavity, which is a superbubble. And um, yeah, and now we get back to the, to the uh, sky view you're used to it. How much of the galaxy did we reconstruct? If this is a Milky Way, we did this, so there's still a long way to go. 
together with this dust reconstruction, we get also statistical information. The method provides the log power spectrum. Um, we can also take power spectra. We can see whether they fit to some series of dust formation. So you get scientific products. Um, statistical characteristics of, of your signals for free when you do this. Um, this was a, <clears throat> a 3D reconstruction of something. Let me show you a 4D reconstruction of something. M78 star resolved in space, time, and frequency. So the black hole around M78 was observed with the Event Horizon Telescope, and the EHT collaboration made this fantastic picture of this um, accretion um, ring around the black hole. It was uh, possibly a, a shadow of the black hole in it. And they've measured in two frequencies. So we have a frequency axis. Um, there we have two dimensions of the space, and they have measured over seven days for the time axis. Um, a team, a sub team of my group around Philip Aras, took the same data and turned it into this image. So that is EHT. This is our image. Ours is maybe a bit less of a um, pentagon. And some of these structures around, which you might see here and there, are gone in our image. So it might have less artifacts. But in principle, it confirms what the EHT collaboration saw, a ring and structures in that. But we did this four-dimensional reconstruction. So not only produced an image, we produced a movie. So what you see here, and you have to look closely, is the time evolution of uh, this emission structure over seven days. You might see it mostly when the movie jumps to the beginning, back to the beginning. And you see maybe a fading of this structure over here over the time, and also a shift in the um, brightness rotations there, indicating maybe a pattern of things moving this direction, but this must be only a pattern speed because a black hole is supposed to rotate in the, as a equation is supposed to rotate the other way around. Anyhow, we use the Bayesian technique. So we can also show you uh, posterior samples. So the movies you see, the 16 movies, show you possible realizations of the time and space uh, evolution of the brightness that are consistent with the data and priors of the kind of uh, I've shown to you like that things are correlated. Now in space, time, and frequency. And we infer the correlation structure in space and time, and in frequency, we just restrict it and say it should be similar. Good, let me use the last few minutes to show you something very different, which actually is however connected if I manage to get out of this movie, which I might do if I uh, terminate the presentation. I have a small technical problem. Hmm. Yeah, sorry. If you have a question in the meantime, maybe you shoot it. Yeah, actually I could have a question here. So, so yeah. what kind of uh, structure you assume for the image? It's like also Gaussian structure? Or... So for we assume the logarithm of the emissivity to have a follow Gaussian statistics of an unknown correlation structure. And um, we learn the correlation structure in, uh, uh, from the data. And we assume it to be a direct product um, of a correlation structure in spatial, temporal, and in frequency direction. So, okay. was this clear? Yeah, well, I see what you mean. <laughs> 
Okay, so in the meantime, I've restarted the presentation. Oh no. And you see that I have a, still a problem. Ah, there. You see this? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, let's change a little bit of um, the topic. So I've showed you that techniques from artificial intelligence can be used for doing the inference with information field theory, but also the techniques we developed um, to solve our problems can be used in, in artificial intelligence research. So you probably all know neural networks and uh, yeah. So you have a number of input nodes, you have a number of output nodes in where you put in numbers and get out numbers in between. There's this network, which are a set of local nonlinear and non-local linear operations, which process uh, numbers from the input to the output. And you can regard this as an, um, as an effect. You have some course, it goes through the network and you get a result, it's a generator. You can even put such networks together by uh, taking the output of one network and put it into the next one. Uh, and that might produce some data, which you can observe or have observed. Here's another network which produce some other data. Here might be a camera which looks at the output of the first input. So with these networks, you basically can build Bayesian hierarchical models. And if you use stick together the right set of networks like generating networks here, classifying networks there, actually you can uh, build um, Bayesian, uh, uh, Bayesian hierarchical models. And what to do with such a model is, okay, now assume you have data, can you go back to the inputs? Can you do the inference trick via Bayesian logic? And using this metric Gaussian variation inference method or other methods, actually it is possible. So here you see some corrupted noisy data. Um, I give you some hint what you're seeing. Actually, it's a picture of a woman of age 33. If you give this information to a network of the architecture I've just shown you with a generator for human faces, classifier for gender and ages, such network you uh, uh, can uh, um, reconstruct that the person might look have like this, or like this, like this, like this, like this. So here we use a generative neural network trained on images as a prior for inference. We can calculate a statistical average. Um, the ground truth was that. Um, that was the data we fed in. And from that data, we saw that it could have been any of these uh, persons. We can play experiments like what happens if we don't tell the network that there was a woman of age 33, then the variance gets a bit larger. So you can do the same um, things you can do with Bayesian reasoning. We can also remove the image and just say it was a woman of age 33, and then you get this sample, including actually a man, which is okay because we enforce the gender only with a 90% uh, probability. What I want to say is um, the techniques we develop for information field theory actually can also be fully phrased in the language of neural networks, and these things can be made. Um, interoperable. So let me conclude. Information field theory is imaging, is a theory behind how to get an optimal image from data. It can be regarded as artificial intelligence, just with networks where the architecture um, is determined by our knowledge. But if objects are too complicated, like human faces or galaxies, you might use techniques from uh, neural network techniques in order to put them in as priors. And information field theory is you. We have published our software package and you can, you're very welcome to download it. There's a resource page on information field theory with papers, uh, introductory articles, links to my lectures, which are thanks to COVID now public, uh, fully uh, online. Um, so if you want to send a student in this direction, the material is there and you're more than welcome to do so. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thorsten. Uh, um, so uh, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand via, via Zoom. Uh, okay, let me see if there are questions. Uh, yes, Christoph. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, could you tell me in your the, the, the package you describe uh, what kind of uh, model is implemented? Does the, the signal have the data has to be a, a linear function of the signal or, or can it be no. arbitrary? It can be it can be nonlinear. So if you look at this uh, Hamiltonian, here we use a log normal model. So we say this quantity S is a Gaussian field which is processed through an E function before it goes through a linear response. So in Nifty, we have an, a number of uh, predefined nonlinear non operations like exponential functions and, 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 and several others and have also implemented the derivatives because we rely on auto differentiation. So is, if your function or no, your nonlinearity is within the class of these functions, you can just code it as, as a formula as you see in front of you. If they're not in the class, you might have to implement that function yourself or you numerically interpolate it. And, and, and there we have also an interpolation function for, the, for that case. So it do, doesn't have to be linear. Okay. I have two quick uh, other questions. So does it um, find a, a unique um, extremum or optimal solution or does it, ex does it explore the posterior? So it depends on which technique you use in order to uh, find your solution. If you use this metering Gaussian variation inference, um, then you, <clears throat> you probe the probability distribution with some, with some Gaussian and explore a little bit around the location and try to minimize uh, a, a distance measure between the true posterior and this Gaussian, the, basically the, the cross information. Um, so this is a compromise between being very local like a gradient descent where you end up in the, well, in one of the optima and um, methods which are completely global like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling. So here is still the risk that you end up in, in a suboptimal minimum because you do not explore everything with that, but it is more robust with respect to that. And we work on improving this. So basically it depends on which technique you use. We have also implemented Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling, which allows you to explore the full posterior, but this is extremely expensive. And so for most real world applications, we are not using it. Um, okay, can, can I ask one last quick question, uh, uh, Irina? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Um, so how would you say uh, what you presented to us differ from um, work by uh, say Bacchus and Gilbert in the seventies or Tarantola in France who, uh, who also used uh, uh, generic um, models with Gaussian priors uh, in functional space. In geophysics, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Uh... I'm not familiar with this work, but I'm not surprised. There were a lot of work which uh, basically did similar things. So it might be that you say the difference is mostly in the size of the problem, the size of the complexity, and um, and, and the solvers and, and numerical methods we em employ. So. Um, I'm not okay. claiming that my group is the first to do does things in this direction. Um, okay, but I was interested in uh, what what aspects what, of yeah. theory you've actually uh, used, because um, it seems to me um, uh, what these people were calling maximum a posteriori, you now oh, calling yeah. information and uh, no, 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 yeah. What, so what they do is. The okay, when they, when they do a maximum a posteriori, they only work out what is the minimum. And maybe they do a Hessian approximation about this. Mm -hmm. This is of, if you have a Gaussian problem, that gives you the perfect solution. 
if you have a high dimensional problem with degeneracies, meaning that the same feature in the data can be explained in various ways. Imagine you have two numbers which get multiplied together to explain an observed number. In this case, you can have various combinations between these two uh, uh, numbers in order to explain the, the data. And only your prior gives you information uh, uh, what is preferred. And in this degenerate situation, the phase-based volume, which belongs to a solution, is important. So several of the things, in particular, this dust reconstruction, uh, mm -hmm. which I've shown to you, with unknown reconstruction with unknown power spectra, um, that does not work very well with maximum posteriori, since this does overfitting. Um, and, and, and there we have to uh, restore to this variation inference method, or if possible, to something which is uh, better exploring the, the posterior. So that's one difference. If they've done maximum or posteriori, many of the things we do are beyond that. But sometimes we do also map, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, Guillaume has a question. Yeah, actually, while we stay on this dust map, so what's the resolution that you achieved here? And um, how, what's the next step? So do you, uh, did you use like the uh, star, obscur um, star obscurations? Did you use, uh, I mean, yeah, can you tell us a bit more about that? <laughs> uh, I forgot the exact resolution. I think it was something like two parsec. So this is an uh, 800 times 800 parsec box, and I think it has two parsec resolution. But we have to look it up in the paper. Mm. Uh, the next step is, um, well, as I indicated, that is what we reconstructed. Mm. There's, a, there's a lot more to reconstruct. Mm. So what we are currently doing is to make this box much bigger, which then becomes very expensive. And um, actually, uh, uh, we have to introduce more approximation and, and, and tricks in order to do that. Um, yeah, I guess so, because uh, if you say four, uh, what you say, 800 and two parsecs, so that's roughly like a 512 cube. Yeah, I think we uh, have, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want to reach the rest of the galaxy, that would be like uh, fairly expensive. Yes, it is. <laughs> and we are not doing it at, at once. We have to we do it in patches. We cannot go down with the resolution because the stuff in front of us, uh, needs to be resolved. Otherwise, we see projection of a uh, cubical pixel into the galaxy volume. So at least nearby, we need a uh, high resolution. So actually, we work on something which has adaptive resolution. Um, yeah, and, and we do it in pieces and have to make sure that the pieces fit together. So it will be rougher than what we do in the, in the, lo in the local uh, uh, universe. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, are other questions for the speaker? Um, okay. Well, I can uh, I can maybe stop the recording now and um, uh, and then uh, but we can still stay and uh, and ask uh, and ask questions uh, sort of more informally because it will not be recorded anymore. So thanks again, Torsten, for the wonderful seminar. Thank you. Thank you.